Hi everyone, this is Dr. Dongfang Wang. Today we're going to continue our discussion on the MSH2 project. In the second part of the project, you will measure the mutation rate in yeast after introducing the MSH2 gene into a mutant yeast. Let's take a closer look at the PMSH2 plasmid. A plasmid DNA usually has replication origins that allow replication in the host cells. The PMSH2 plasmid has three replication origins. The first one, CoE1, is the replication origin that allows replication in E. coli. The plasmid also has replication origin that allows replication in yeast, as well as replication in a virus. Over here, we have an ampicillin-resistant gene, which is the selection marker. It allows the E. coli carrying this plasmid to grow in the presence of ampicillin, which is an antibiotic. Over here, we have another selection marker called His3. This will allow yeast carrying this plasmid to grow in the absence of histidine, which is an essential amino acid. Down here is our gene of interest, the MSH2. Once we have determined the identity of the three plasmid DNAs, we can introduce them into yeast and then measure the mutation rate. The yeast strain we used here is an MSH2 mutant. Because MSH2 is required for mismatch repair, the mutation rate in this yeast strain is usually very high. If you introduce an empty vector into the yeast strain, this is not supposed to do anything to the host yeast, therefore the mutation rate will remain high. On the other hand, if you introduce a functional MSH2 gene into the yeast, it should restore the mismatch repair mechanism and lower the mutation rate. Well, now the question is, what's going to happen if we introduce a mutated version of the MSH2? Will this restore the mismatch repair mechanism, or will the mutation rate remain high? The yeast strain used in this experiment also carries a reported plasmid called PSH44. The reported gene is the gene URA3 fused to a simple repetitive sequence called GT16.5. This is also called a microsatellite sequence. GT16.5 is sequence GT repeated 16.5 times and then fused to the open reading frame of the gene URA3. ATG is the start codon for URA3. During replication, DNA polymerase has a tendency to make mistake when replicating repetitive sequence. Sometimes the DNA polymerase will slip, produce 15.5 instead of 16.5 of GTs, and this will cause a frame shift mutation and the functional URA3 gene will not be produced. In the wild type allele for this reported gene, we can see a continuous open reading frame running from the microcytolite sequence all the way down to the first methionine for URA3. After the frame shift mutation that occurred during replication, we can see the frame shift is altered and ATG is no longer read as methionine. This will prevent URA3 protein from being produced. So how does this reported gene work in an FOA assay? To illustrate the connections among all the components that are present in the FOA assay, we will use concept map to map out all the connections. In a concept map, we use a verb to connect two terms. For example, the PSH44 plasmid contains the URA3 reported gene. This gene encodes an enzyme, and the enzyme converts FOA to 5-fluorouracil, which is a toxin. This toxin kills the yeast. In concept mapping, we use arrow to indicate positive connection and block to indicate negative connection. From the previous slide, we know that URA3 gene is fused to a microsatellite sequence which is prone to mutation. 
Therefore, a frame shift mutation has a tendency to inactivate the URA3 gene. This is a negative connection illustrated by a block. On the other hand, the yeast also contains the PMSH2 plasmid that we introduced into the yeast. This plasmid contains the MSH2 gene that encodes the MSH2 protein. When the plasmid is present, the MSH2 protein is present. This will repair the frame shift mutation or block the frame shift mutation from occurring. Therefore, there is no mutation, which means the URA3 gene will stay active, producing an enzyme that's going to turn FOA into a toxin and that's going to kill the yeast. Therefore, in an FOA assay, no growth on FOA plate means the mutation rate is low. On the contrary, if the yeast grows on FOA plate, that means the mutation rate is high. Now let's look at how the whole project is set up. Our independent variable is whether there is a mutation in gene MSH2. Our control is the wild type MSH2. Our experiment is the mutated MSH2 carrying M718I SNP. SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism, in this case caused methionine at 718 position to be changed to isoleucine. We can introduce both plasmid into yeast and measure mutation rate using FOA assay. When we introduce the wild type MSH2 into yeast, the mutation rate should be lowered because MSH2 can repair mutations. When we introduce the mutated MSH2 into yeast, if the mutation rate is higher compared to the control group, we can conclude that this particular SNP increased mutation rate, or this SNP abolished the function of MSH2. However, if we didn't observe higher mutation rate, the mutation rate stayed low as the control group. This means that this SNP does not cause any change in mutation rate or this SNP does not affect the function of MSH2. The FOA assay will allow us to evaluate whether a particular SNP can abolish the function of MSH2. In another word, this assay will allow us to evaluate whether a patient carrying a particular SNP has a higher chance of developing the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer.